Policies like the 1994 crime bill and welfare reform implemented by former President Bill Clinton and supported by Hillary Clinton decimated black America, according to Michelle Alexander, author of The New Jim Crow. In a piece for The Nation titled Why Hillary Clinton Doesn't Deserve the Black Vote, Alexander describes how the Clintons escalated the drug war, presided over the largest increase in prison inmates in U.S. history, and tore the federal safety net for poor families to shreds. In a recent interview with MSNBC, Alexander reiterated how and why the Clinton dynasty embraced these policies and moved the Democratic Party farther to the right. Many people of color don't know or fully understand um, how this system of mass incarceration was constructed, why, and the devastating consequences for our communities. And the Clintons, um, you know, had a, you know, an important role. They escalated the drug war and the Get Tough movement far beyond what the Republicans had done, while at the same time dismantling the federal social safety net and transferring billions of dollars away from child welfare and housing into a prison building boom unlike anything the world had ever seen. The election of Bill Clinton marked the turning point for the Democratic Party, um, where the Democratic Party decided <laughs> that in order to win over those so-called white swing voters, the folks who had defected from the Democratic Party in the wake of the Civil Rights Movement, in order to get those folks, um, you know, they were going to have to begin proving um, to that so segment that they could be tougher on right. them than the Republicans had been. In 1994, President Clinton, with the support of Hillary Clinton, signed the $30 billion crime bill into law. It's a very well thought out crime bill that is both smart and tough. If we have more police interacting with people, having them on the streets, we can prevent crimes. We can prevent petty crimes from turning into something worse. But we also have to have an organized effort against gangs, just as in a previous generation we had an organized effort against the mob. We need to take these people on. They are often connected to big drug cartels. They are not just gangs of kids anymore. They are often the kinds of kids that are called super predators. No conscience, no empathy. We can talk about why they ended up that way, but first we have to bring them to heel. And the president has asked the FBI to launch a very concerted effort against gangs everywhere. And I believe it is now time for all of us to know what we can do individually to be part of this anti-crime, anti-gangs, anti-drug effort. As Hillary Clinton described in the 1990s, the crime bill marked an escalation in the wars on drugs and crime. This draconian legislation created dozens of new federal crimes and introduced the three strikes law and mandatory minimum sentences. It also expanded the death penalty to cover more than 60 offenses, lowered the age for federal prosecutions to 13, eliminated Pell Grants for prisoners seeking education to prepare for release, and allocated $16 billion for state prison construction and expanded police forces, $500 million to house juvenile offenders, and bonus grants to states to develop programs to prosecute youths as adults for violent crimes. As a result of these policies and others, during Bill Clinton's tenure, the U.S. prison population doubled from more than 1 million to more than 2 million people. As Alexander notes, crushing poverty, unemployment, police targeting, and billions in funding transferred from public housing and welfare programs to the mass incarceration machine meant that black Americans were disproportionately affected by Clinton's harsh policies. In fact, Alexander says by the end of Clinton's presidency, more than half of working age African American men in many large urban areas were saddled with criminal records and subject to legalized discrimination in employment, housing, access to education, and basic public benefits, relegated to a permanent second-class status eerily reminiscent of Jim Crow. The Clintons have since renounced the bill, and presidential candidate Hillary Clinton has promised to reform some of its provisions if elected. According to Clinton's website, her proposals include eliminating the sentencing disparity between crack and cocaine possession, decreasing but not eliminating mandatory minimum sentences for nonviolent drug crimes, and abolishing private prisons. It was odd then that when Black Lives Matter protesters recently confronted former President Bill Clinton about the negative effects of the 1994 crime bill and welfare reform at a rally, he went back to aggressively defending the policy. I had an assault weapons ban in it. I had money for inner city kids for out of school activities. We had 110,000 police officers. And Biden said, you can't pass this bill. The Republicans will kill it if you don't put more sentencing in. I talked to a lot of African-American groups. They thought black lives mattered. They said, take this bill because our kids are being shot in the street by gangs. We had 13-year-old kids 
planning their own funerals. Because of that bill, we had a 25-year low in crime, a 33 low in the murder rate, year low rate, murder rate. And listen to this. Because of that and the background check law, we had a 46 year low in the deaths of people by gun violence and who you think those lives were that matter. Instead of acknowledging, as he has in the past, that the crime bill helped fuel mass incarceration, which disproportionately affects black and brown Americans, Clinton downplayed the bill's harms and exaggerated its benefits. He even defended the use of the term super predator by Hillary Clinton in 1996, accused the protesters of lying and supporting murderers and gang leaders, and pretended that when African Americans were protesting gun violence and crime in the 1990s, tough on crime policies were the only changes they were asking for, which Alexander points out is most certainly not the case. I don't know how you would characterize the gang leaders who got 13 year old kids hopped up on crack and sent them out onto the street to murder other African-American children. Maybe you thought they were good citizens. She didn't. She didn't. You are defending the people who kill the lives you say matter. Tell the truth. You are defending the people who caused young people to go out and take guns. There was a 13-year-old girl in Washington, D.C. who was planning her own photos. How would you do it? Now, look at this other one. Look at this. That's not true. As former president, Clinton should be aware of his own record. And when campaigning for Hillary Clinton, Bill should expect and be receptive to criticism of that record. After all, the Black Lives Matter protesters aren't stupid or uninformed. They have a surplus of legitimate grievances. And unfortunately, Clinton proved he couldn't care less. Maybe the protesters were upset that with the support of Hillary, Bill funneled $16 billion to states to build prisons, while slashing $54 billion in public welfare. Perhaps they're protesting the fact that Clinton instituted mandatory minimums, the three strikes law, and other harsh policies, doubling the U.S. prison population, while helping to ensure that one out of every three black males born today will go to prison at some point in their life. Maybe they're ticked off because instead of investing in education, healthcare, and the like, U.S. agencies waste about $80 billion per year, locking up more than 2 million people. Possibly their anger stems from the fact that despite similar usage rates, blacks are about four times more likely than whites to be arrested for cannabis. Or maybe they hold resentment because black drug addicts are still hatefully caricatured, while white addicts are often shown compassion. Now that drug use has become or perceived as a white problem, yes. There's this wave of compassion and concern. No one's calling for a war. No one's calling for mandatory minimum sentences for, you know, heroin addicts and for people who are committing these kinds of offenses. The kinds of horrible, grotesque caricatures that were done of, you know, people who are struggling with crack addiction. Um, we don't see that in the media around, you know, the many, many white folks who are strung out on heroin and desperately need support. And yet, you know, we have suddenly, you know, space in our hearts um, for concern and for compassion and for treatment and alternative approaches. And you don't hear much thumping and calls for war. Fortunately, a truly progressive candidate, Bernie Sanders, also has a shot at the Democratic nomination. And unlike Hillary Clinton, Sanders isn't taking millions of dollars from pharmaceutical and private prison corporations or other powerful special interests. While Alexander hasn't endorsed a 2016 presidential candidate, she says she supports the political revolution Sanders advocates. I could not be more thrilled um, with the movement that is arising um, all over this country to support the creation of a real democracy in the United States. Um, you know, I think Bernie Sanders is absolutely right to call for a political revolution. Uh, we don't have a real democracy. Today, our politicians are, you know, pretending to serve two masters, the people who elect them and then the people who fund them. And unfortunately, for millions of people who cast their votes every year, um, they rightfully wonder whether their politicians are responding more to the people who fund their campaigns, um, including large pharmaceutical companies, big banks, payday lenders, private prison companies, um, than the people who have elected them. Sanders wants to end mass incarceration, going so far as to claim that should he become president, at the end of his term, the U.S. would no longer imprison more people than any other nation. What's more, Sanders wants to end the federal prohibition of cannabis, abolish private prisons, demilitarize police forces, eliminate mandatory minimums, hold police accountable when they break the law, 
and reinstate Pell Grants, among other priorities. While Senator Sanders reluctantly voted for the 1994 Crime Bill to support the assault weapons ban and violence against women provisions, he vociferously opposed and attempted to amend its mass incarceration and death penalty provisions. Through the neglect of our government and through a grossly irrational set of priorities, we are dooming today tens of millions of young people to a future of bitterness, misery, hopelessness, drugs, crime, and violence. All the jails in the world and all the executions in the world will not make that situation right. We can either educate or electrocute, we can create meaningful jobs, rebuilding our society, or we can build more jails. Mr. Speaker, let us create a society of hope and compassion, not one of hate and vengeance. With Sanders winning the last eight out of nine state primaries and caucuses, and now beating Hillary Clinton in national polls, he still has a chance to obtain the Democratic nomination. And based on Clinton's record, including her past support for the crime bill and welfare reform as First Lady, as well as her corporate campaign contributors and persistent lack of support for ending cannabis prohibition, can Clinton really be trusted to bring about any real change?